Okay, hope you enjoyed your lunch and uh, welcome back. So this is session three continued. In the morning, uh, we heard about racing as a brand and how to increase it as a global brand. Uh, we heard about consumer and demographic trends that are pointing us towards this being the Asian century. Uh, and then we heard about how to expand racing's fan base, uh, both by making award-winning television, uh, which ITV Sport has done with its coverage of the Grand National in the UK last year. Also with new technology, I particularly liked uh, the 360 degree helmet cam that Una Chan was showing us about. And of course we heard about eSports. There are new sports coming and uh, the way people engage in these new sports can also be instructive of course, to the world of racing. But another way to expand racing's fan base is uh, to make it more diverse, both for the people who want to watch it, whether they want to watch it at the event itself or whether they want to watch it through new media and the internet, or indeed people who are working in racing. Uh, diversity means also inclusivity. So we have four eminent speakers here with uh, personal understanding about how to increase diversity in racing. So first to speak will be Victoria Mary Carter, who's deputy chair of New Zealand Thoroughbred. Victoria is going to talk about driving diversity through racing. Ladies and gentlemen, Victoria Mary Carter. Hello. In 2016, the theme of the conference was galloping ahead globally. The speakers I learnt most from were the ones who made me think about what I could take back to my own country. So I hope some of what I say encourages you similarly. If racing wants to expand its participant base and get more fans, then the fastest way, I think, is through diversity. More women in racing at all levels, not just on course, will mean that we have a greater chance of innovation, collaboration and transformation. If you can't see it, how can you be it or believe that it's possible? There's so much evidence today that if younger women can see women in roles, then they believe that it's possible for them too. And that's why we need more of us in these roles. Growing up, I was lucky. I watched my mother and many other women work. She might argue she wasn't so lucky because at the time she worked for the South China Morning Post as a journalist in the late 60s and she was paid a third of what men were paid. Fortunately, equal pay is a little bit more of a norm now, but that's another speech entirely. I had another role model, my godmother, one of the first colonels in the British Army. I had lots of role models and some of the women my mother knew or the extraordinary women that she interviewed, clever women, successful women, good women, but because she took me to work with her in the holidays, I saw other women working, and it never occurred to me that I wouldn't have the same chance. And that's one of the most important reasons why we need more women in racing. Having more women, not just one, in senior roles, on management teams, on boards and in government is so important because it shows all women that it's possible and that you don't have to be unique, exceptional or chosen and it becomes more of the norm. And it's those words becoming more of the norm that I want you to all think about, particularly when half the world is women. Wherever there are men in leadership or governance roles, there's no reason why women can't be there too. And it's important that women are in these places, and I'll explain why soon, not just serving or waiting or doing menial jobs. For racing to gallop ahead, we need women in leadership roles, and there are so many qualified women, they just need a chance and they need to be seen. And it's our job to make sure that we encourage more women into roles in racing, into administration and into governance. Australia and New Zealand have led the world with women jockeys, trainers and more. Gay Waterhouse, Natalie Young, Donna Logan, Linda Jones, Michelle Payne, just to name a few. And in my country, New Zealand, we were the first to give women the vote. Many other countries have had women leaders and they've shown that they can do a good job. So what does women in racing mean and why is it so valuable? I asked a few women in racing, what does it mean to them? And they said things like, with women making up half the population, getting more women on 
course, and in amongst the sport, can only be positive. They'll spend more money on clothes, handbags, entertainment, and betting, and you never know, eventually they may well buy a share of a horse. Another pointed out to me that women have a clearer attention to detail, and in the sport of inches, that's very important. Said another, I employ plenty of women in my stable for this reason. Horses in general are usually more responsive to a kinder, gentler approach. And with so many women now in the full operation of her stable, it makes for happier horses and better winning results. Another said, when it comes to organization, women tend to be way more efficient in productivity and time management. Being such multitaskers in everyday life comes into play. For nearly all my life, I have sat on mostly male boards as the only woman. But the boards where there is balance are so much better. If we want good decisions, good strategies, and great outcomes, then we need good discussion. And that usually comes from having people around the table that don't look like us. If you sit at a table with mostly the same kind of people, it means that you probably all think the same. And that won't help our industry move forward. Neither is it representative of our community, the world we live in, or our customers. There's almost no industry in the world that isn't having to challenge itself, reinvent itself, or rethink why it exists and how does it stay relevant. And that's why diversity or gender balance matters. The reason why it matters is that change will make our industry stronger and better. The more differing views discussed, whether it's around a board table or on a leadership team, the more open to possibilities, open to change, and aware of the future will be. A diverse board or management team offers insights, perspectives, and experiences to a chief executive from these differing views that a non-diverse board can't do. On a non-diverse board, everyone shares similar views, has had similar experiences, so things will move more slowly. Patricia Lenkoff wrote an article for Forbes that examined gender diversity in the bottom line. And her top reasons on why diversity is so important for a successful industry are one, that it reflects the real world, something every business needs to be sensitive to, that healthy debate leads to better decisions. Divergent backgrounds means tackling the same idea in differing ways, that great ideas come from disruption of the status quo, that your clients and your customers are diverse, and that this can make your industry knowledgeable and sensitive to a wider variety of groups. Counsel from a variety of authorities is sensible. Setting an example at the top, hopefully, will have a trickle-down effect within your organization, will improve your reputation and brand, and a variety of backgrounds can make an organization more adaptable in this ever-changing environment. And there isn't an industry today that doesn't need innovation or new ideas. Racing's not alone there. The good news is that if you want some fresh thinking and innovation, then there's an easy way to do it with diversity. And if you need any more encouragement, both Boston Consulting Group and McKinsey have come out with reports in the last month on how increasing the diversity of leadership teams leads to more and better innovation and improved financial performance. In both developing and developed economies, companies with above average diversity on their leadership teams report a better and greater payoff from the innovation and higher EBIT margins. Even more persuasive, you get these gains with relatively small changes in the makeup of a senior team. People with different backgrounds and experiences often see the same problem in different ways, and they come up with different solutions, increasing the odds that one of those solutions will be a hit. And in this fast-changing environment, such responsiveness leaves companies better positioned to adapt. <clears throat> but if you want innovation, it's only when women occupy a significant share of management positions that the innovation premium becomes evident. Innovation revenues kick in when more than 20% of management are female. 
Companies in the top 20% of financial performance have more women in their leadership team, nearly 20% more than those in the bottom 20% of financial performance. The biggest takeaway from the study, a strong and statistically significant correlation between the diversity of management teams and overall innovation. Companies that report above average diversity on their management teams report innovation revenue that's a lot higher than companies with below average leadership. 45% of total revenue versus 26%. And the companies in the top 20% of financial revenue have more women in their leadership team, nearly 20% more than those in the bottom 20%. Many organizations have long established culture with a homogenous leadership team, primarily older men who rise through the ranks of their company. To foster diverse viewpoints and perspectives, you need to be proactive with internal changes that go far beyond the hiring process. We need to approach diversity as we would any other business imperative. We need CEOs to own the agenda and visibly lead it and success requires accurately assessing the company's starting point, establishing specific goals, creating a roadmap with milestones and clear accountability, identifying the target, how fast you want to achieve it, how will you implement it, and what are the consequences if the initiative falls short. Adding one woman won't make that difference to get innovation. BCG notes that there are five other environmental factors which help amplify diversity's impact. And some of these are somewhat obvious and some of them linked to the speakers we heard this morning. One of them is partici participative leadership behavior. When managers genuinely listen to employee suggestions and make use of them, diversity's benefits multiply. Swarovski, the, Australian, the Austrian sorry, manufacturer of cut crystal, uses what it calls nudges to remind executives that their meetings will be more productive if attendees actively participate instead of deferring to those who are more senior. And the nudges take different forms, including signs in hallways and white ball reminders in conference rooms. Then there's openness to cognitive diversity. This describes a dynamic in which employees feel free to speak their mind. The German cable company Unity Media encourages opposing ideas and constructive conflict in discussions amongst peers and between employees and managers. A culture where change starts with a question, not a decision. For example, what if we did dot, dot, dot. And then there's strategic priority. France's Airbus Group whose Balance for Business initiative aimed at increasing gender diversity at the largely male aeronautics company has been endorsed by top, the top executive team. Frequent interpersonal communication. When companies find ways to encourage different people with different backgrounds to chat to each other, it provides a creative spark and bolsters innovation. Think of Google's cafes, which allow for spontaneous conversations amongst people with different educational work and nationalities, as well as those with vastly different levels of experience. And then there's equal employment practices. There's nothing new or complicated about that, but it's still not universal. Some companies are further ahead than others. The US apparel group Gap has eliminated the pay differences between its male and female employees. Of the five work environment conditions, it's participative leadership behavior, which I think is really a euphemism for feeling safe to speak up, appears to be the most important. 68% of companies said it was a prerequisite to diversity-led innovation. The next most common prerequisite at 62% is openness to cognitive diversity or encouraging opposing ideas to be explored. So if we want more women to participate in racing, and to expand the fan base, my challenge is to look at the people in our meetings and in our teams, and if they all look a bit the same, then question how can we get the other 50% involved, and then we'll create more innovation. And in that vein, and since we're also a sport, I want to salute Formula One Grand Prix, who for decades have had the practice of employing grid girls, and who made the decision to stop it because, quote, 
This custom doesn't resonate with our broad values and was at odds with modern day societal norms. These changes are taking place because global businesses are making a considered choice about how women should be valued and portrayed in their sport in 2018. A business example that I stumbled on was Toyota, who have recognized this with President Toyota shuffling top management to tackle what the automaker calls a now or never competition about surviving or dying in this new era. As mobility changes, Toyota says, quote, a crucial battle has begun, not one about winning or losing, but one about surviving or dying. Toyota then made big changes to its management team. The president said, we need to have people who understand the workplace well enough to lead with quick judgment, quick decisions, and quick action. So he introduced a gender and nationality diversity. Chika Kako was Toyota's first female engineer and is now the company's top-ranked woman. She hopes being in the leadership team will encourage more women to pursue careers in the old guard Japanese automaker and enrich internal debate. Toyota significantly wants to have a woman's view of its business. They also appointed a new CEO, an ex-banker, Fukutomi-san, who said, quote, I was told to blow a new wind from outside and quicken the pace of change. It's time for racing to show that it's not an older man's sport, but to live up to contemporary needs. This will require change, but it will mean that racing is strong and relevant tomorrow. So to end, I'm going to go back to where some of us began our education at kindergarten. This is a slide that's on many walls of many kindergartens all over the world. And it reminds me a little bit of conferences like this. We come together, different individuals from different countries, valuing each other regardless of our skin, our sex, our intellect, our talent or years, to share ideas and information. For racing to expand its participant base, it will be by valuing the differences that we all can bring to the table, by collaborating, by innovating, and then transforming. That's what's going to ensure racing's future. Thank you for listening. Victoria, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next to speak, we have Susanna Gill. Susanna is Director of External Affairs at Arena Racing Company. She's also a member of the Diversity in Racing Steering Group in Great Britain and a council member of Women in Racing in Britain. Her topic is British Racing's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Susanna, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here and to speak on such an important subject, which I know all of us on the panel care about, and I'm sure you do as well, as a really important topic for the sport. Um, of all the positions that I hold in racing, being a founding member of the Diversity and Racing Steering Group, which we set up in British Racing last year, is the one I'm most proud of, and I will come on to talk about what we want to do in the sport. The idea of this is to show you what we're doing in British racing to tackle this enormous subject. It's not to tell you that this is the way you should do it, but it's to give some ideas and share some best practice. It's very much a learning process for us all. The areas that I'll cover in uh, detail are what British racing currently looks like in terms of what we're doing in strategy of diversity, how we're addressing the subject, how we're developing a coherent plan and what we'll do with um, the next steps of the plan. So just a quick snapshot of what British racing looks like to set the scene. We've got a really good news story. The sport is growing. Um, we've got six million people coming racing every year. We sit behind football as the second most attended sport. We've got a healthy number of young people coming racing um, and that number continues to grow each year. We've got some brilliant TV coverage across three channels. As we heard earlier, award-winning ITV and superb channels in, in At The Races and Racing UK. We continue to attract, um, have high prize money, 160 million a year and growing and continue to attract the best horses in training with some of our feature meetings and festivals. 
we have also last year reformed the levy, uh, which means we're now capturing revenues from online, which is helping build a more constructive relationship with betting operators after, after years of sometimes having a difficult relationship. Um, and in short, you know, we have an enormous national, international footprint, and I'm sure all of you there recognise those scenes that are up on the screen as, as scenes that do go around the world every year. However, we also have a challenge. Like every nation that has racing in its jurisdiction, we are constantly trying to remain relevant. And a good example of this is a survey that was done by YouGov at the beginning of the year, which asked sports fans what sports they found most boring and most exciting. And I suppose the good news is British racing was seventh, but we did have 52% of people finding it quite or very boring versus 25% finding it exciting. And that really touches on everything that we would discuss today and all the themes of how you make the sport relevant in a modern era. Um, it, it touches on all of, the, all of the issues that we're discussing. And certainly diversity is part of answering the question. Um, in terms of the strategy for British racing, um, this is a slide stolen from the BHA um, in terms of how we as stakeholders are working together in the virtuous circle of revenue, reputation and relevance, which I'm sure is a, is a circle being used in other jurisdictions because it's key to maintaining the future of the sport. And again, diversity and inclusion fits into that absolutely at its heart. The good news is we have a lot of natural diversity in British racing and I'm again I'm sure this is the same in other jurisdictions. We've got 85,000 people, um, 85,000 people either directly or indirectly employed in the industry. Horseman covers a broad, ra uh, broad range of um, jobs and uh, incomes for people. We have race course staff that really come in all colours and creeds and ages. Um, at ARC, we've got people that start on our race courses at 16, and we've got Eric, our parade ring manager, who's 95, started his 30-year career at Utoxeter at the age of 65. So really, we welcome everyone in, of all ages. We have also management and administration, Weatherby's BHA, various roles that need to be filled, as well as the sales side and bloodstock side of the industry, which is enormous. If you look at racing, equine, welfare and care, you've got vets. Um, farriers and charities, and indeed human care is taken just, just as seriously with the Injured Jockeys Fund, Racing Welfare, and a host of excellent community-based charities that work with racecourses and others in the sport. Hospitality is a vast employer um, on race days. At ARC, ARC uses sort of three, four hundred casual staff members each year for our, for our big festivals. And then there's all the related industries that wouldn't really be in their present form if it wasn't for racing, from betting, journalism, fashion, millinery. Um, and a lot of these roles are all advertised centrally on a careers in racing, racing website. So we're helping to try and get people into the sport. However, we have some challenges. Again, I'm sure other nations do too. We are still perceived in Britain as a white man's rich sport, and yet the great irony is we are reliant on so many people that are not white, rich, or men. We, particularly in the management of racing, are still very white, predominantly male and middle-aged, and you have to question where, if those people are the people that can bring the innovation that we need to grow our sport. Racing staff has been a particular subject that we've focused on in recent years in, in Britain. Um, Brexit has sort of brought it all closer to home, realising that we have 25% of staff that come from outside uh, Great Britain, 11% from the European Economic Area and 13% from further afield. If we have any problems post, in a post-Brexit era with that, we're going to have even further staff shortages. So we've got to find a way of wanting to attract people to come look after horses because it's an essential part of the industry. This year in Britain, we've had gender pay gap reporting since April. Um, I think if anyone saw the coverage of that for most industries, there were some very stark numbers um, in terms of the difference between the top of, top of industries, a uh, number of women in there versus men, and therefore what the pay gap was. Overall, the number was 18% for Great Britain. Uh, in racing, there was a 16% pay gap at the BHA, 21% at ARC, 3% at Jockey Club. Um, however, lots of organisations 
employ in racing employ less than 250 people, so don't have to report that information yet. So in short, what we're trying to do in Britain is attract the brightest and best people to our sport and retain them in an economy which is pretty much full. We have full employment in Britain. That's good news, but it's tough for racing. Therefore, the most important bit is that we've got to be seen as open for business, and diversity has a huge part in that. Um, I'm going to go into detail of what we've done in recent months, but I wanted to just set a timeline of what's happened in the last decade, because it has taken a while to address this subject. It's not something that has been achieved or is being achieved quickly. It's a really long-term thing. Um, the first date I've chosen is the formation of, of Women in Racing by Sally Rowley-Williams. This really was a pioneering movement. Um, it was the first of its type and quite extraordinarily actually received some opposition from people in the sport, even though uh, women representative organisations in different areas of life are really commonplace. But maybe that shows how far we've come because it wasn't nearly 10 years ago. Um, 2011 was the first Leaders in Racing conference, which was held at Chelsea's ground. And I particularly picked that out because it was the first time that I went to a racing event as a bag carrier for the boss. And I was, in fact, we had, a, we had panels all day, and I was the first woman at four o'clock to ask a question and point out that I was the first female voice to be heard all day as a mon moderator, a speaker, a questioner, anyone. And there was a sort of intake of breath, and I think that perhaps that was the first time British racing realised quite how male it was before we even get onto the other aspects of diversity. Um, lots did happen between 2011 and 2016, but I've skipped to that because that was the next bit which has really galvanised change uh, in, in the modern era where we had funding from the Racing Foundation, which is looking after the proceeds of the sale of the tote, and women in racing enabling some research from Oxford Brooks, which hadn't been done in the industry before. This research published in May, was published in May 2017, um, entitled Women's Representation and Diversity in the Horse Racing Industry. And on the back of that, we formed the Diversity in Racing Steering Group. And we will be making our first publication next month, so this is a bit of a preview for everyone. So, in short, the message is, it really does take a while to do these things. But what you don't do is just keep calm and just wait, because if you do that, absolutely nothing will happen at all. It's for all of us to make things happen. So, as I said, the, the most important thing that's happened recently is the research from Oxford Brookes University. This is, this is done by the Centre for Diversity Policy Research and Practice at the university, and they are experts in their field. In producing this research, um, we worked with two eminent researchers. The first was Simonetta Manfredi, sorry, Professor Simonetta Manfredi. Um, she has done so much work, um, I'll summarise it as award-winning work, that is, um, looking at work-life balance, gender and age discrimination in the higher sector. She's worked for the European Commission, European Social Fund, the Department of Trade, or, or business as it now is in Great Britain, um, been an advisor to the Italian government and is a qualified workplace mediator. And Kate uh, Clayton Hathaway has um, a biography that makes me feel very inferior. Um, she studied at Oxford Brookes, has a first-class degree in social change, a master's, uh, from London Metropolitan. She then joined Oxford Brooks in a professional capacity and is currently studying for a PhD. So what they don't know about research and diversity in different sectors probably isn't worth knowing. So I don't think we'd have been able to tackle the subject without their expertise. And what they did was a three-stage process in producing a 60-page report. And these were the stages. They started with desk-based research. They looked at academic literature, which was available on racing. That didn't take them that long because there wasn't a vast amount in the modern era. There were lots of historical references, but nothing terribly useful for modern times. Um, and they did, then did a very important exercise where they looked at all the organisations in racing and looked at their gender makeup um, to see where, where, they, where women were in the industry, in the leading organisations. We then constructed an online questionnaire which went out to the whole sport and had nearly 400 responses. Um, the idea with this was to try and galvanise and get information from people on the key issues. So it was, it was a detailed enough survey, but it had enough tick boxes that if you wanted to do it quickly, you could do it in five to ten minutes, because a lot of people don't want to spend longer than that on a survey. But if you wanted to 
put in more information and share your thoughts, you could fill that out and spend as long as you like on it. So they were very, very happy with getting nearly 400 responses, of which 80% which were from female respondents. Um, and the final, final stage of the research was interviews with 16 key stakeholders in the sport from all different areas, from the management, from horsemen, from the media, uh, in order to take up sort of 45 minutes to an hour of their time and get their view, because if you don't get the view of the decision makers and the people in positions of influence, then it, nothing's going to happen because all of us here who are in positions of influence are the ones that can make, make things happen. Importantly, the research was com done completely confidentially, so anything anyone said was not shared. Um, it was completely independent. Um, I, for example, don't know the 16 people that were interviewed. I produced a long list of names for them, but they chose it and they've never told me who it was or what they said. So it was genuinely confidential and independent which is really, really important. The areas it covered were looking at the working environment, so what everyone had to, the environment we're all working in, because at the end of the day, we're all constructs of that. It looked at career development and support, uh, what was there, what was lacking. They developed the research into looking at what, where women were in senior positions on, on boards and, and where they were in the industry. And then they looked very specifically at career areas so that there was a, chap a small chapter on each area. So if you were a jockey and you wanted to see what they thought about jockeys, you could go to that without having to read the whole report because if you produce a 60-page report, the chance that anyone reads the whole thing is very, very small. So the whole point was it was meant to be user-friendly research. And this was a quote which I think kind of sums it up really for racing from, from a female participant about it being a lifestyle and I think that's the same in every country. Um, and it means people are very loyal to their sport, but it does make change hard. And that's certainly what they found with the research. Some of the key findings was it was a rapidly evolving industry. There were staff shortages and a lot of complex careers that all intermingle with each other, but are all quite independent. And it's quite hard to navigate your way through that if you don't have someone helping you and you're finding your way in for the first time. There are progressive thinkers, but there's also a lot of inward conservative and traditional thinking, particularly as some male dominator with powerful stereotypes. Um, British racing tends to have a habit of saying no too much. Work-life balance was a challenge. Particularly, there was a banter culture. Uh, that was found particularly in stable yards. They looked um, at female representation, which was 16% across the board, but almost zero on some boards and, and higher in the charitable sector. They particularly focused on female jockeys as a very visible part of there being um, inequality in the industry and a much better need for career advice uh, networks and mentoring. From this research, they made a number of recommendations, which if I run through, the key one was to organize a uh, greater understanding and develop a body to drive change because it won't happen if someone doesn't lead it. To look at career advice and development, to look at le women in leadership positions because, as we heard from Victoria, if you can't, you can't be it if you can't see it. To nurture people through their careers and to recognise the need for work-life balance and pastoral care. And this is a pretty, this is another stark quote, which I think so many of us in the room would want to disagree with, but it is a quote that we received from the research. And so we, it has to be an issue that sexism is, is felt as to be an issue in the industry still. We launched the um, research at York, University, uh, York Racecourse um, with the Oxford University team, uh, which is in fact tomorrow, so we're one day short of the anniversary. Um, we had 60 guests and we had extensive press coverage from it, which is really important because there's no point doing any of this work if people don't know you're doing it. From this, we have formed the Diversity and Racing Steering Group, which was a central recommendation of the research. Long list of people, but nice to see their names up there. They all deserve to be up there. They're giving up their time voluntarily to do this. We've created ourselves a new logo, so you know it's real. Um, we are being administered, we're working through the BHA and they're offering resources to help us. We've created a uh, aims and parameters for the group, which is a moral and commercial case diversity. We will take the recommendations of the Oxford Brooks research and try and implement them. And we want to lead, consult and advise, but what the group can't do is set policy or enforce policy. Oh, yeah. 
Um, as well as the strategy, uh, which falls into the research, there's also an opportunity for some quick wins in this area. Uh, those are adverts taken from the Racing Post earlier this year. And the Women in Racing Committee felt very frustrated that they're lacking women, uh, which is silly, really, when 40% of racegoers are women. Uh, four Cheltenham Festival winners were ridden by women this year, uh, and at least two of the senior Racing Post team are women. Uh, so we had a quick word with the Racing Post, and lo and behold, we've got some adverts that look a little bit more like the whole of society. So sometimes I know there's a need for strategy and long-term thinking, but you can also just do some quick things yourself. We are now going to produce an action plan, which will be published in June. I can't give away too much now because it hasn't been approved by certain uh, people in the sport that we'd like to see it. So um, just to summarise what it will be including, but you'll be able to see the, uh, the full document, the full document uh, next month, probably after Royal Ascot, we won't get in the way of that. Um, it will cover leadership and governments and looking at leaders, leaders in the sport and, and what those organisations and people should be doing. We will look at what data should be collected because we need to further that work because until Oxford Brooks, we didn't have any data at all about what people felt or where they were in the industry. We'll look at how we can use our role models to help um, bring people into the industry and showcase careers in the sport. We want to better recognise our workforce and make sure that if we have awards and celebrations, we don't put barriers up to anyone. In, uh, for example, the annual Godolphin Southern Stable Staff Awards, the winners are normally about 85 to 90% white, which is not reflective of stable staff. So we need to make sure we're celebrating people across the sport, regardless of what they look like. It needs to be based on what they achieve. We want to continue to see promotion of, of racehorse ownership broadened. There's already some good work going on there. And we want to bring people into a more dynamic experience at race courses and when they're enjoying racing um, because we would like to make sure that the horse and the sport remains central to coming racing because at the end of the day that is our product that is what the sport needs to promote and look after and that will be coming out next month so um, we will deliver on that action plan uh, which will take some resources, and that's all things that we need to decide as a sport where the priority is to make sure that we do that. We want to ensure that we'll do annual updates to hold the, the sport and all of us in the sport to account to make sure we get things done. And we want to stay true to the central vision of making sure that everyone in racing feels welcome and can be, wants to come racing and can build a career in it so it's inclusive for all. Thank you for listening. Time to kick back and discuss. Thank you very much indeed, Susanna. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Client Development PR Manager at Phasig Tipton. Anna Seitz Chanello is going to speak to us. Well, the title is there it is. It's all about the girls' female ownership syndicate. So over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you to the Asian Racing Conference for inviting me to speak today. It's an absolute honor to be here, especially with these amazing women I'm on the panel with, and I'm excited to share my story with you all today. I'm the Client Development and Public Relations Manager at Phasic Tipton, and on the side, I'm a racing syndicate manager for an international racing syndicate. I thought I would begin by telling you a bit about my background and how I got started in the thoroughbred business. Next, I'll talk about what inspired me to begin putting racing partnerships together, and ultimately, what led to starting It's All About the Girls Racing Syndicate. Then I'll discuss the impetus behind taking my syndicate to an international level with my good friend, Legs Lawler in Australia, which led to campaigning a champion filly, Global Glamour. And finally, I'll touch on where I'm hoping that my syndicates were heading and how female ownership has opened up a new market for racing. I grew up on my family's Brookdale farm in Versailles, Kentucky. Brookdale was the home of leading sires, deputy minister, Forrest Wildcat, crafty prospector, sire of 2001 Japanese champion older horse, Agnes Digital, among others, and is also the birth birthplace of 2012 Kentucky Derby winner, I'll Have Another, who currently stands in Japan. We also uh, fold out the champion older stayer, an old fan favorite, California memory. Ever since I was a little girl, my summers were spent working on my dad's farm, and I gained a lot of hands-on experience. 
I think this was important for me as it gave me a great appreciation for the horses and the knowledge of the animal. During my college years, I would come home for summer break, and that's when I started doing more office-related work on the farm. This is when I learned more about the business side of operating a breeding farm, as well as the thoroughbred industry in general. And I remember the moment I decided, this is a really cool industry, and I'm going to do this for a living. After, after graduating from the University of Notre Dame, I spent some time in Europe, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, where I worked for different farms and sales companies to get a better education. It was, it was terrific, and I met some wonderful people during my travels, connections of whom I still work with and now own horses with today. When I returned to the United States, I was lucky to land a job with seven-time Eclipse Award-winning trainer Todd Pletcher, where I would stay for four years. The racetrack was such a different pace from the farm life, and I just loved the excitement. Todd had a lot of high-profile owners, and that's where I got my introduction to dealing with the owners and learning how to communicate, communicate with so many different personalities which would serve me well in my next role at Phasic Tipton, but especially in my racing syndicates. Another benefit of working for Mr. Pletcher is that I got to be around some of the best horses in the country. It was exhilarating to win so many races, and I knew that one day I would want to experience the feeling from an owner's perspective. I just had to. One of my most memorable experiences in my life was when Rags to Riches, a filly, beat the boys in the 2007 Belmont Stakes. I was lucky to pony her every morning on the racetrack and spend a lot of time with this amazing filly. She was very popular and had so many fans, many of whom I noticed were female. They would send letters to the filly, gift baskets, carrots, presents. I couldn't believe it. I was put in charge of responding to all of her fanfare. And it was amazing to see how many of these women that connected with this filly, they were female. How many people were females? They didn't own her. They never met her. They just felt like they could relate to her, and I thought that was pretty special. In 2008, I contacted the Lexington-based auction house, Phasic Tipton, and they offered me a sales and marketing position, which is where I still am today. This was a very exciting time for the company, as it had recently been purchased by Dubai Synergy Investments, and it was going through some major changes. I was also, at the time, the only female in the United States to be hired to a sales position by a thoroughbred auction company, which was a little daunting, but also very exciting. One thing the new management team wanted to really focus on was new owner management. In 2000, new owner development. In 2010, we launched the Phasic Tipton Racing Club. And it went pretty well. We had 30 members, but it was at a rough time when the economy was not doing very well, so it didn't last very long. But it was successful in that many of the members from the initial club went on to buy horses at the sales. The Racing Club provided me for another way to reconnect with the racing side and to witness again how exciting it was for people to experience the thrill of watching their horses compete on the racetrack. It sort of ignited a spark, and I decided that I would try putting together my very own racing syndicate on the side. I was just dying to own, or at least partly own, my very own racehorse. So I called about 20 of my friends, males and females, from college, from the horse business, and I asked everybody to pitch in a little bit of money. We bought a little bay filly for $20,000. We named her I'm Already Sexy, and we ended up making $750,000 on the racetrack with her. She won multiple graded stakes races. She took us all over the country. She took us to some of the best tracks, and to, it was just an absolutely amazing experience, and we had so much fun. She had a lot of fans, and we received a lot of publicity. We weren't a bunch of millionaires. We were just a bunch of young, enthusiastic people owning a racehorse, having fun, and I think a lot of people could relate to us and wanted to do the same thing. You could pretty much say I was hooked from there on out to ownership because of I'm Already Sexy. While campaigning our filly, I noticed that a lot of the wives and sisters of our partners were really enjoying the experience. They would come and watch their filly train in the morning, and they'd come by the barns in the afternoon. They would come to the races to be in the saddling paddock. In all of my time in the horse business up until that point, it was evident that the vast majority of owners and racing syndicate members were men. I knew that there were a lot of women who loved the horses and the excitement and the pageantry, but they were, in large part, missing from the ownership side, except for a few select female owners. It seemed to me that there was an enormous market that the industry had yet to tap into, and that was women. In 2013, I reached out to a female equine lawyer, and she helped me draft an operating agreement, and it's all about the girls, and all-female racing syndicate was born in the United States. Since I realized we were extremely lucky with our first syndicate, and I understood most racehorses are not going to make a profit, I really tried to emphasize the social aspect of our syndicates. We want our partners to have fun, and we want them to learn about the sport. And tell each, we tell each prospective partner that you should join for the experience and not necessarily treat it as an investment. 
You can enter a racing syndicate hoping to make a financial return, but you'd be fooling yourself to expect one. This is more of a lifestyle decision, similar to joining a country club, with a chance to meet lifelong friends and have a heck of a lot of fun in the process. Most of our partners come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, but our common love of the horse allows us instantly to form a bond. Many of our partners have not only become friends, but they have gone on to do business together outside of horse racing. Some have gone on to partner with each other on brood mares, pen hooking, and other things, which I think is fantastic. We do have some women who buy into every single one of our partnerships, as they know it's a numbers game, and hopefully the good runners they're associated will make up for the slower ones. They also know that rather than owning 100% 100% of a horse that might run once a month, they can own 5% of 20 of them and have a lot more action. Some of our partners live hundreds or thousands of miles away from their horses, so communication is of paramount importance. Our trainers routinely take photos, videos, workouts, and we send weekly email updates to keep each partner informed of their horse's progress. We alert our partners via email as soon as the horses are entered into a race, and we always send our trainers' thoughts and analysis prior to each race. The partners are notified of the result the same day and are sent a link to the race replay when available. There's so much technology these days, you don't have to live where your horse is. It's always fun, but at least you can stay informed through all the technology. We try to make our syndicates as education as possible. We want the women to feel that they can learn as little or as much as they choose, and that there's no dumb question. A lot of women are intimidated by owning horses, and we don't want them to feel embarrassed to ask me questions. Since day one, we have encouraged our prospective partners to come to the sale when we are shopping for our future racing prospect. We're heading to Maryland right after this, this weekend, to stop for two new fillies, and a lot of the women are going to be joining us. We feel that the partners who are involved in the entire, entire process really gain an attachment to the horse, and the more they learn, the more they will get out of the experience. We ask for suggestions for names for each new acquisition, with the name eventually coming down to a vote. We only buy fillies, and each filly is sold at the conclusion of their racing career, which is also determined by a group vote. We try to let the women be involved in some of the major decisions. Since many of these horses will run them fewer than 10 times a year, you have to find occasions to get together that do not necessarily center around your horse running. I try to align, our, align ourselves with sponsors to enhance the experience and create more value for our syndicate members. We schedule various social functions at different venues, and our sponsors really make these functions economical. For instance, we have a wine and champagne sponsor who supplies the alcohol at our parties in the United States, and everyone knows how much women love to drink champagne. Another sponsor, ExpressBet, which is an advanced deposit wagering website owned by the Stronic Group, arranges a suite for us at the races every year. So we can enjoy a nice afternoon at the races while they educate us on how to bet and give out free racing programs. It's wonderful and the women get to learn a different side of the sport. My friend and local, local chef gets Whole Foods and Supermarket to sponsor the food at our brunches. We did one on the backside of Churchill Downs on Kentucky Derby Day. Although it's always fun when your horse is actually running, it's just a minute or two, so we try to make the whole day out of it. It's, it's all about the experience you are trying to offer or create. If your horse doesn't run well, the partners don't necessarily remember that, but they do remember spending several hours standing outside the barn at a brunch, laughing and drinking champagne with their friends right in front of their horse's stall. <clears throat> we also piggyback off of the sales by doing joint cocktail parties with Phasic Tipton, Magic Millions, Arcana, and Golfs. And it's a nice way for the sales companies to give back and help us as well. We have brunches and dinners sponsored by Whole Foods at our house on Brooktail Farm, where we get to walk around and show the partners the foals and yearlings and teach them about the whole business. They just love being up close and petting the horses and having a real connection with them. We found that they enjoy learning about the business and the horses, and these relationship-building opportunities are just as valuable as watching your horse cross the wire first. We invite all the partners to our different functions, regardless of which horse they are involved with. I've noticed that the women come into the winner's circle even if they are not involved in that particular horse, and I love to see them celebrating together, supporting each other. Owning, your horse, owning a horse by yourself is great, but sharing it, with, on the, sharing it on race day with 20, 30, or even 40 of your friends is even better. We had a lot of wealthy women who used to own horses 100% by themselves or with their husbands. But then they joined It's All About the Girls and they realized this is a lot more fun to do it with a bunch of women. And so that's pretty cool to see they've joined us. According to the U.S. Jockey Club Thoroughbred Owner View website, it's listing 68 syndicates in operation in the U United States. I didn't want to be just another syndicate and I knew I had to do something new and innovative to reach a different demographic. 
The concept of an all-female horse racing syndicate was, the original, was an original idea, and we received a lot of publicity because of it. However, how are we going to continue to grow our syndicate in such a crowded marketplace? marketplace? My role with Fasic Tipton was changing in that I was traveling abroad quite a bit and promoting our sales and recruiting buyers. I was always impressed by the Australian people and their passion for the sport. It seemed that the horse racing and breeding business was very robust and strong. I knew how popular syndicates were in Australia, and while traveling to the Magic Millions Yearling Cell on the Gold Coast about four years ago, I ran into a friend of mine, Elaine Legs Lawler, the director at Goff's Auction House in Ireland. I told Legs about my all-female syndicates in the United States, and we instantly decided to do the same in Australia. Legs lives half the year in Australia and half the year in Ireland, and she's very connected to the horse industry, especially in those two countries. So she and I reached out to all of our contacts worldwide about our new syndicate and how we were about to form it. We called everybody we knew, and before you know it, we had 40 women from seven countries involved in our first It's All About the Girls Racing in Australia. We bought a nice little filly for $65,000, and it turned out to be Global Glamour. We sent her to the barn of Gay Waterhouse. Who else? She is now a multiple group one, in, group one and two winning champion three-year-old mare. And this group of women have had the absolute time of their lives. This filly has earned more than one and a half million dollars and taken so many women to the races and to, to an absolute thrill. Now, when partners from the US or from England want to come to Australia, they have a whole network of women that they can reach out to to show them around and vice versa. Since then, we now have three fillies currently in Australia, and we have also started, it's all about the girls in Ireland, with two fillies that we just started last year. The two fillies in Ireland are with Jessica Harrington, another extremely capable female trainer. We had our first runner there in Ireland three weeks ago. Her name is Chica's Amigas, or Girlfriends, and she beat the boys in a salty maiden race in a very impressive fashion. Jessie Harrington said she's going to run a listed stake this weekend, and if all goes well, on to Royal Ascot. Could you imagine the turnout of all these women at the races? We have a proven track record of picking successful runners, which is very important to remaining relevant, as people have a short-term memory in this industry. Winning races is a big part of the excitement, and you must have some success on the racetrack in order to keep partners coming back and to attract new owners. We do not solicit new members through advertising, as is illegal. We rely on referrals from current or past partners, and we communicate success on the racetrack via social media in order to generate new interest in future partnerships. The success of Global Glamour's partnership hasn't gone unnoticed, and we've been so fortunate to come across this phenomenal filly. She has generated so much press for our syndicate, and we get emails weekly from women eager to join the next partnership from all over the world. Our trainers have turned out to be our biggest promoters. Ron Moquette, who trains for us in the United States, along with his assistant and wife, Laura, have brought us many new women. They have large followings on social media, and they utilize this tool to notify their followers of our newest acquisitions. Ron has a very good eye for horse, and he helps us identify prospects at the sales. In today's world, you can't deny the presence of social media, and we definitely use this free platform to build our brand. We are having a lot of fun, and the women really seem to be enjoying the camaraderie. I give every woman a bracelet, just like this, but different colors all over, and it's kind of like we're all a part of a little sorority together. Having a piece of, horse, of a horse gives you something to look forward to, and the brevity of many of these horses' racing careers means the partners will have to look to make sure they diversify and re-up. We have had a request to branch out to France, England, Argentina, and even South Africa, so we're exploring these options now. How exciting. We just need a few more hours in each day. I guess some of our partners need a good excuse to travel around the world, and that's what makes horse racing so wonderful. It exists in just about every country of the globe, and in every corner of the globe, and in some incredible cities. Just look at us all here. I had no idea how much fun the Korean Derby would be, was until I experienced it on Sunday. While we can't guarantee the new prospective partners that their horse they have is going to be a champion, we can offer them an opportunity to network with other fun-living women who are passionate about horses with a chance of making memories that will last a lifetime. We intend to keep our syndicates fun, educational, affordable, and hopefully our string of good luck will continue for years to come. The idea has certainly caught on in the US as well as Australia and Europe, and there are now many others who have adopted our all-female model. It is very gratifying to see it catching on, and I am thrilled that I could play a part in this movement of getting women into racehorse ownership. Racing clubs have become very popular in the United States. Churchill Downs started the first one, where the track bought, buys a horse and allows about 200 members to buy in at only $500 each. They're growing, and a lot of other tracks are copying this. However, 
I've yet to see a racetrack start an all-female racing club, so this might be something that people should look into for the future, as I think it would be very well received. In summary, if you've ever thought about buying a racehorse or starting a send it with your friends, you should definitely do it. It's intimidating, but just surround yourself with the right people. Hire the best trainer, the best blood stock agents, the best jockeys and vets that you can find. Let them do their job, but make sure you have an open line of communication with them. Make, come up with a sound business plan and always stick to your budget at the sales, which I'm definitely guilty of not doing that sometimes. But my number one rule on these syndicates is always to put the horse first and don't forget to have fun. I'll leave you by showing you this extremely embarrassing and humiliating video of me watching our filly, I'm Already Sexy, run in a grade three in Chicago in 2014. I was busy working a horse sale, so I couldn't attend the race, but my friend, who I did not know at the time, was watching me watch her. Hopefully, if you haven't experienced this pure joy, you will soon in the near future, because there's nothing like winning a race. Thank you. Happy racing. One fit, no excuse from here. Come on, Laurent. Come on, Laurent. Go, come on, go, come on. Come on, Laurent. Go. Come on, Laurent. Oh, sorry. She's going. She's going. Send her. Send her. Send her. Send her. Thank you, Ray. You were riding that horse oh, there, weren't you? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, thank you very much indeed. Okay, so our fourth speaker, well, Susanna had mentioned about everybody should feel welcome in racing. So we're going to be a bit more specific. Megu Megumi, your turn. Megumi Ichiyama is chief of staff from the publicity department at the Japan Racing Association. As you can see, they have a particular project to bring women to race courses. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity today to speak about the Umajo project, our promotional measures to attract ladies and women to race courses. These are the contents of my presentation. First of all, what is Umajo? <clears throat> Umajo is a term created by JRA, combining the Japanese word uma or horse plus jo of jose or women to mean women who like horse racing. The Umajo project started in 2012. At that time, JRA was facing two serious concerns. One was declining turnover, and the other, aging racing funds. What then JRA focused on was the spreading of information and trends by ladies and women may possibly contribute to the expansion of our farm base. There have been cases in which something that seems to be associated with men gained popularity among young ladies such as cup cards, ladies who are great supporters of Hiroshima Toyo Cup, one of Japanese professional baseball teams. Yama cards, yama meaning mountains, and ladies enjoying climbing mountains. And sujo, su is the abbreviation for sumo and women who enjoy watching sumo wrestling. The number of female attendants now may only be a few. However, we believe this will not always be the case. I mean, we can change. If we could bring ladies and women to our race courses, 
we can revitalize the popularity of horse racing itself. Thus, we started the Umajo project to work on attracting ladies to race courses. By the way, could I ask all gentlemen one question? Have you ever had a hard time to understand women's feeling? <laughs> I am sure many of you here have exper experienced a sense of desperation that women's minds never be understandable. You may wonder what in the world I am talking about, but this is the key to our project. The Umajo project team consists solely of female, female officials in 20s and early 30s, which is the same generation and the same gender as our target. We did have various promotional measures for ladies before this project started in 2012. However, most of them were conducted by men only and did not last for long. We believe it is necessary to discuss what, need, sorry, what needs to be done to attract ladies to race courses through the eyes of the same gender and the same generation as our target. Our current team consists of about 30 female JRA officials from various sections. The first thing we did in this project was to research and recognize Sorry, we, uh, sorry. The first thing we did in this project was to research and recognize the situation. When this project started in 2012, the number of female attendance per year was about 870,000, and it was only 40% of our total attendance. The public image of this course was still a place only for men. Therefore, even if women have interest in racing, it, it was very hard to say, I want to go racing in public. And there was not much guidance given to women at their first visit. According to the survey, the following feedbacks were reported. There were not enough space for ladies and it was very uncomfortable. When I went to the race course with my female friends for the first time, nobody knows about racing and we were completely at a loss. Based on that, our team spent a lot of time discussing what we need to do for ladies and decided to call our female horse racing fans Umajo. And we conducted various promotional events to show that women can also enjoy horse racing. We also set up an area exclusively for women with, within the race course. This area is what we call the Umajo spot, where we provided ladies and women with refreshment, relaxation, and <coughs> racing information. The main reasons for establishing Umajo sport are to offer comfort to ladies and to give guidance to women coming to the race course for the first time. At the Umajo spot, concierge service is provided by the project team members. There are introductory brochures and ladies can enjoy backyard tours. We are there to provide support for ladies and women to have an enjoyable and comfortable time at the race courses, even if it was their first visit. Both the exterior and interior of the spot are decorated with very cute and lovely, mo lovely horse motifs to encourage ladies to post them and spread them through social media. We aim for greater customer satisfaction and repeating visit by providing complimentary refreshment, sales of original dessert, and hosting various workshops for ladies and women. This is the first major spot set up at Tokyo Race Course in 2013. 
Now, there is a major spot at each JRA race course. What our team is currently working on is to increase public recognition of Umajo and Umajo spot. Now, please watch a promotional video of Umajo. やっぱうまかっこいいな。月さんは春ですよね。父ちゃんは人派です。じゃん。ラッタッタ。結構イケメンいますよ、ジャッキー。ジョッキーね。あ、ジョッキー。じゃあ、せーので言っとく。行きます